Welcome to another beautiful, beautiful day. Man, isn't it gorgeous outside? It's unbelievable. This is November, and we're we're still just enjoying the beauty. Got a few leaves left, and uh, but we're glad that you're joining us here today, especially if you're joining us via the internet. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan and Jim and Sandra Penner. This is our weekly ministry. Uh, to you all and if you're joining us via the internet we're always honored that you take time out of your day and uh, to be with us and uh, to worship with us wherever you are we literally stream this thing around the world and uh, we uh, I, I always think of uh, Steve and Sue hiding when they were on vacation they, they were going man like we were at the base of the Matterhorn man and watching the service at some <laughs> internet bar somewhere <laughs> Oh, that was pretty cool. Happy birthday. You want to see? Yeah, I wish Steve happy birthday, man. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Yeah. We're glad that you're here. We're we're gonna do uh, gonna do a couple of contemporary songs. I always do a, a lot of the old hymns, but uh, since this is uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I, I decided to do a, a couple of little uh, contemporary things. One of them that we haven't done before, so I'm gonna teach you. Uh, as we sing it, but they're real easy. Everyone needs compassion, love that's still failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nation. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. All through of salvation, He will. In my life, Father, everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose in Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world sing. We sing it for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world sing. We sing it for the glory of the risen King. Jesus.
It's a song called Good, Good Father. I want to teach you. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard tender whispers of love. In the dead of night and you tell me That you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're a good, good father That's who you are That's who you are That's who you are And I'm loved by you That's who I am That's who I am That's who I am I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Cause you're perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. saying that. I want to pray this morning and um, certainly want to continue to, to remember the, the people in California, uh, all of the fires that have taken place. You know, we, we deal sometimes with tornadoes and uh, where I'm from in, in Charleston, we, we always have to deal with hurricanes. But <clears throat> this fire thing is just is unbelievable and uh, the devastation that it's had in California that it's made, it's, it's just uh, just mind-boggling. And um, so we certainly want to thank for the, the loved ones. Uh, and just keep keep that in your mind and keep that in your prayers. Just think about them when you can. And uh, can't even imagine what it's like to just totally lose 
everything that you have, including uh, family members. So certainly want to keep them in, in your prayers today. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you today that you are a good, good Father. And that we are loved by you. We certainly lift up the people of California today, God. And, and we just lift them up to pray that you would bring them comfort and peace in a, in a way that only you can do it. Lord, uh, sometimes it's so easy for us just to take for granted everything that we have and, uh, and not remember all of the blessings, all of the things that you've done. Today, as, as we look at your word, I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, open our minds, let us give us ears to hear and hearts that are yielded to you that we might be thankful for everything that you do for us, in us, and through us. We pray your blessings today on our message, God. We ask your blessings in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. But today, uh, the title of this message is Being Thankful in a Thankless World. And we're going to look at one verse today in, in 1 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be in uh, chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, one verse. And I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation today. It's one verse, verse 18. And that verse uh, says this. It says, Be thankful in all circumstances. How much is all? Everything. It's everything. Isn't it? <laughs> Be thankful in all circumstances. And I want you to listen to this. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Several years ago, there was a, a Charlie Brown cartoon about Thanksgiving. And the cartoon pictured Charlie Brown bringing out Snoopy's dinner on Thanksgiving Day. But it was just his usual dog food in a bowl. So Snoopy took one look at the dog food and said, Well, this isn't fair. The rest of the world today is eating turkey and dressing with all the trimmings and all I get is dog food. <laughs> because I'm a dog, he said, all I get is dog food. He stood there and he stared at the dog food for a moment and said, well, I guess it could be worse. I could be a turkey. <laughs> Always something to be thankful for, isn't it? There was a young man feeling very proud of himself. Uh, as a brand new college graduate, he had taken, a, taken the CPA exams and passed with flying colors. Now he was a, a full-fledged, certified public accountant. And his father had been a, an immigrant uh, in the United States. And now he owned his own little business and... So this son, filled with self-importance, the young man began to criticize the father's way of keeping his books. <clears throat> he said, Dad, you don't even know how much profit you've made. I mean, over here in this, this drawer are your accounts receivable, and over there are your receipts, and you keep all your money in the cash register. You don't have any idea how much money you've made. The father answered, well, son, when I came to this country, the only thing I owned was a pair of pants. Now, your brother is a doctor, your sister is an art teacher, and you are a CPA. Your mother and I own our own home. We have a car. We own this little business. Now, add that up. Subtract the pants, and all the rest is profit. <laughs> Add it up. 
added up. That's exactly what we need to do during Thanksgiving, is add it all up. We came into this world with nothing but the eternal soul that God gave us. Everything else is profit. Amen? Amen. We can never give too much thanks to God for the things that he's blessed us with. Amen. That's what our scripture tells us this morning is to give thanks for everything. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. It sounds easy, doesn't it? But the truth is, society as a whole finds it rather easy to take, but terribly difficult to give thanks. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle said that an unthankful attitude would be one of the characteristics of the last days. And Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Any of that going on today? Yeah. And though none of us are as thankful as we should be, the Word of God tells us that even in days like this, especially when it comes to dealing with our enemies, we are to love your enemies, is what the Bible says. Love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. And I want you to listen to this verse. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Did you get that? He, God, is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. That's Luke 6.35. If there is any one thing for which we should be thankful today, it is the fact that God in His mercy and His grace is kind to the unthankful. That's why y'all don't want me to be God. <laughs> I don't do good in that area. I fall very short of that all the time. Not sometimes, all the time. I look for positive stuff, and then when I don't find it, heck with you. 2 Peter 3, 9 <clears throat> says this, and this is one of the reasons that, that God is kind to the unthankful. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God isn't late with his promise as some measure lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want any one lost. He's a good, good father. He keeps holding things back, restraining his hand, restraining himself on account of each one of us and especially for the unthankful and the wicked because he doesn't want anyone lost. The end of that verse says he's giving everyone space and time to change. Throughout history, it has been man's tendency to be unthankful. All you got to do is look throughout the Old Testament at, as God's people, the people of Israel, how unfaithful and unthankful they were time and time and time again. 
And it, it's not that they didn't suffer consequences, they did. You know, one time God had them wander around in the desert for 40 years because of their unfaithfulness and being unthankful. And so it's, it's one of the reasons that the writers of Scripture were always prompting us to encourage us to give thanks to God. Psalm 92, 1 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Psalm 106, 1 says, Praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 107, 1 says, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. If you ever read through Psalm 136, that whole thing is, is that his faithful love endures forever. He's a good, good father. These are, are just a few of the many, many verses in the Bible that exhort us to be thankful to the Lord. However, today I want to focus on one specific step to take. When it, become, when it comes to being thankful in a thankless world. If 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is true, and I believe that it is true, then how do we do what it says? In all circumstances. Yeah, but Teddy, you, know, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what I'm facing. You have no idea what kind of life I've had to deal with. In all circumstances, be thankful. We do it by remembering, by focusing on truth, the facts of who God is and what he's all about and what that means to us as believers. Four facts that I want to share with you this morning that I hope will help us all be thankful in a thankless world. The first fact that I want you to remember is to remember that God is faithful. God is faithful. You see, faithfulness is part of God's character. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Even in the, in the last book of the Bible in Revelation verse uh, 11 in chapter 19 it says then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. The word faithfulness implies that one is trustworthy, loyal, and reliable, and dependable. It refers to one who can be counted upon. The faithfulness of God is the basis of our faith in God. Did you get that? The faithfulness of God is our foundation. It is the basis of our faith in God. Because mankind will fail you. Men, mankind may fail you, but God never will. Faithfulness is an inherent part of who he is. And here's why. God has never broken a promise. He is totally reliable. Now, it may not seem that way sometimes. When your prayers aren't answered, when you don't get the things that you ask for, and you just don't see God working anywhere, and all you can see is the stuff in front of you. But God is, has never broken a promise. 
He is totally reliable. 1 Kings 8.56. And by the way, you're going to hear more scripture today than you've probably heard in a long time. Because I love proving and using the scripture to prove what I'm talking about. Because it's not me saying it. It's what the Bible says. 1 Kings 8.56, Old Testament book, says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise which he spoke by Moses, his servant. Not one promise has failed. It was May 7th, and a guy named Roger Sims was hitchhiking his way home, having been discharged from the Army. And so he, he flashed his hitchhiking sign at a car, but almost lost hope for a ride when he noticed that it was this black, sleek, new Cadillac coming down the road. But to his amazement, the car stopped. As Roger entered the car from the passenger side, he notices that the driver was this handsome, well-dressed man who appeared to be in his 50s. The guy says, going home for keeps? Roger said, I sure am. And as the two talked, as they conversed, Roger was able to find out that the driver's name was Hanover. And Mr. Hanover owned and operated a, a business in Chicago. A rather successful business at that. And the longer Roger talked to Mr. Hanover, the more impressed he felt to witness to him about Christ. Finally, when they were only 30 minutes away from Roger's home, he got up the nerve to share Christ with Mr. Hanover. And eventually asking him if he would like to receive Christ as his personal savior. To Roger's amazement, the gentleman immediately pulled the Cadillac to the side of the road, bowed his head, and received Christ. Mr. Hanover thanked Roger and said, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened in my life. Five years later, Roger had married and was the proud father of a two-year-old son and even had a business of his own. And while packing for a business trip to Chicago, Roger found Mr. Hanover's business card that was given to him five years earlier. He decided that he would look him up while he was in Chicago. And after arriving in Chicago, Roger looked up Hanover Enterprises. And the receptionist there told him that it would be impossible to see Mr. Hanover, but that he could see Mrs. Hanover if he wished. <laughs> well, he was ushered into this beautiful office where this keen-eyed woman greeted him. And she extended her hand and said, I understand you knew my husband. Yes, I was hitchhiking home after the war, and he gave me a lift. When was that, Mrs. Hanover asked. It was May 7th, the day I was discharged from the Army. Was there anything special about that day, asked the lady. Roger hesitated for a moment, but he said, yes, ma'am, there was. He said, I, I shared the gospel with Mr. Hanover. He pulled over to the side of the road and leaned over the steering wheel and wept. He gave his heart to Christ that day. With that, Mrs. Hanover suddenly began to weep, and she wept so hard that her whole body was shaking. And when she regained her composure, she said, I had prayed for my husband's salvation for years. I believed God would save him. And where is Mr. Hanover now, asked Roger. He's dead the lady said. Struggling to speak, she said, he was killed in a car crash right after he dropped you off. He never got home. Barely able to speak through her sobs, Mrs. Hanover then said, 
You, you see, I thought that God had not kept His promise. And I stopped living for God five years ago because I thought that He had not kept His word. The truth of that scripture that I, I, I read in 1 Kings makes a lot of sense now, doesn't it? He never, ever forgets his promise. He is totally reliable. Totally trustworthy. The second fact that I want you to remember in God being faithful is that the faithfulness of God gives us confidence in prayer. The things that we pray for, they may not happen today, they may not happen tomorrow, but they're going to happen. One day the great evangelist George Muller began praying for five of his friends and after many months one of them came to the Lord. And ten years later two others were converted. It took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. But Muller persevered in his prayer until his death for the fifth friend. And throughout those 52 years he never gave up hoping that he would accept Christ. His faith was rewarded for soon after Muller's funeral, the last one was saved. It gives us confidence in prayer to pray for the things that are on our hearts. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. God is faithful even in our calamities, even in our difficulties, even in our struggles. There was a, a guy, a Nobel Prize winner, his name was Elie Wiesel. He was a survivor of the Holocaust. And he tells of his time in the concentration camp. He and a few others were forced to witness the hanging of two Jewish men and one Jewish boy. The two men died right away, but the young boy struggled on the gallows. Someone muttered behind Diesel, he said, where is God? Where is he? And then the voice growled again, where is he? Then he heard a voice softly within him saying, he is hanging on the gallows. Where else? Psalm 119, 75 and 76 it says this. The psalmist writes, I can see now, God, that your decisions are right. Your testing has taught me what's true and right. Oh, love me. And right now, hold me tight. Just the way you promised. Now comfort me so I can live. Really live. One of the most tragic events during the Reagan presidency was the Sunday morning terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, in which hundreds of Americans were killed or wounded as they slept. Many of us can still recall the terrible scenes as the day survivors worked to dig out their trapped brothers from beneath the rubble. A few days after the tragedy, I recall coming across a, an extraordinary story. It was about a, a Marine Corps uh, commandant, commandant uh, a guy named Paul Kelly. And he visited some of the wounded survivors in, the Frank, in Frankfurt, Germany. He went into the hospital, and among them was a, a, a corporal. His name was Jeffrey Lee Nashton. He was severely wounded in this incident, and Nashton had so many tubes running out of him, in and out of his body, that a witness said he looked more like a machine than a man, yet he survived. 
And as Kelly neared him, Nashton, struggling to move and racked with pain, motioned for a piece of paper and a pen. And he wrote a brief note and passed it back to the commandant on a slip of paper. But there were only two words, Semper Fi. It's the Latin, Latin motto for the Marines, meaning forever faithful. That's God's motto as well. Throughout everything that this life hurls our way, God is faithful. You see, it's terribly easy in times of trouble and turmoil to think that God has suddenly turned on us, that he's forgotten about us. He's forgotten about our circumstances. But the psalmist realize that even when God allows affliction to come our way, he does so out of love and loyalty to each one of us. The things that God often permits to happen in our lives are not always good. Can I get an amen? <laughs> or no <an> my. <laughs> However, Romans 8.28 always reminds us that they work together for our ultimate good. And because of that, God's faithfulness is also continual. It never stops. Psalm 119.90, your faithfulness endures through all the ages. You have set the earth in place and it remains. Malachi 3, 6 says, I am the Lord and I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. No one will ever be able to rightly accuse God of not being faithful for there will never be a time, never be a time when God is unreliable or undependable. He will always keep his word. You see, God's faithfulness stems from his compassion for us. One of my favorite verses in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every Morning, great is your faithfulness. That means every morning we have new mercies coming our way from God. Every day we get a do-over. You ever need a do-over? You ever, you know, take a mulligan? Yeah. Every morning, the Bible says... His mercies toward us are new. His compassion for us never fails. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. It comes out of His merciful, loving kindness. You know, a lot of times I talk with people and it's like they think God is up there with a bolt of lightning ready to, you know, strike them. Or he's up there with an eraser and a piece of chalk, you know. You're in, you're out. No, well, well you should have done that. Well, that's it, right? I'm breaking you. You're out of here. See, that would be me. <laughs> Again, that's one of the main reasons you don't want me to be God. <laughs> it is his love. Because if he, if he didn't love us in that way, the law, the law of his holiness, the law of his holiness would demand and execute our judgment. As a matter of fact, Jesus' death on Calvary was for the sins of mankind, which satisfied the demands of God's love, as well as his holiness. It satisfied everything. It paid the price. That's why the old saying that you hear me say often is so powerful. That Jesus came to pay a debt he did not owe. Because we owed a debt that we could not pay. 
Galatians 2.20, Paul tells us, this is from the message, says, Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or, or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God because Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, Paul says, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm not going to go back on that. The second thing is not only remember that God is faithful, but also to remember that God is forgiving. Our forgiveness comes through that relationship that we have with Christ Jesus. In the book of Acts, in four, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, again from the message, it says, Salvation comes no other way. No other name has been or will be given to us. No other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Only this one. It's the only way. You hear people talking all the time about being spiritual <laughs> and having a form of godliness, the Bible says, but no power. A lot of people say, oh, there's all roads lead to heaven. Yeah. Jesus said narrow is the way. Broad is the way to destruction. There is only one name by which we can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.2 2 says this, When he, Jesus, served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good. Not only ours, but the whole world's. Again, that's why God is kind to the unthankful and the wicked. Because the debt has been paid. All we have to do is receive it into our lives and into our hearts. You see, for our forgiveness is one of completeness. We are complete in Christ. Colossians 2 says this, when, when you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all of the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. I love the message. <laughs> Doesn't that give you a picture of what Christ accomplished for us? He did it for you. If you were the only person on earth, Christ would have done the same thing. He would have done it all for you. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. One rainy day, a young mother and her seven-year-old boy were driving through one of the main streets of their town, and little Matthew seemed to be pondering something as he stared at the windshield wipers doing their repetitious work going back and forth. And Mom, Matthew said, I've been thinking about something. Well, what's that, his mom asked. I was thinking that the rain is like sin. And the windshield wipers are like God wiping our, our sins away. So after the chill bumps stopped running up and down her arms, Matthew's mom says, that's really good, Matthew. But do you notice that how the rain keeps coming? What does that tell you? And without any hesitation, Matthew said, we keep on sinning. And God just keeps on forgiving us. 
Our forgiveness freed us from sin's consequences. Yes, we miss the mark every day. Like the joke I always tell you, you know. Today, I haven't cursed. I haven't been judgmental. I haven't slandered anybody. I haven't talked bad about anybody. I haven't done any of these things. I have not sinned. But in just a few moments, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> every morning, we have new mercies toward us because every day, in some form or fashion, we miss the mark. And God just keeps on forgiving us. And it frees us. That relationship with Christ, that forgiveness from God, frees us from the consequences of sin. Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death. That while we were of no use whatever to him, now that we are set right with God by means of his sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 1, Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. The third thing is to remember that God is our Father. That He is a good, good Father. And because He is our Father, guess what? We are His children. Romans 8.16 says the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, sometimes we may act, act like redheaded step, stepchildren. Nothing against redheads. I don't, I don't take it personally. But Psalm 103 and 4 says this. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Because we are his children, we're assured of his care. We are highly valued by our heavenly Father. Luke 12, 6 and 7 is, what's the price of two or three pet canaries? Some loose change? But God never overlooks a single one. And He pays even greater attention to you down to the last detail, even, in, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bulky talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. That's why your answer to the question people often ask, hey, how you doing? I often say, I'm blessed and highly favored. That is the truth of who we are as God's children. I love the answer that Dave Ramsey gets, you know, the financial planner, Christian financial planner. He always says, you know, how you doing, Dave? Well, I'm better than I deserve. And that's the truth. We all are better than we deserve. What I deserve is to be in hell with a broke back. That's what I need. That's what I deserve. But that's not what I got. I got God's grace. I got a relationship with his son. And I was a hard sell. I was pretty stubborn. I was full of myself. I was three A's. I was triple A. <laughs> Angry, arrogant, and addicted. Full of myself. But God cares for you so much for each one of us that he also directs and disciplines us. How many of you have children or have had children or grandchildren and you just kind of let them do their own thing? You never discipline them. You never straighten them out. You never call them on anything. They just have free run of the house. You wouldn't raise your kids that way, would you? 
and God doesn't deal with us. Hebrews 12 says, My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. God is in the business of guiding and directing us. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God cares for us so much that he's concerned about everything that concerns us. He's not up there going, gee, Dad, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know you were going to do that. I, I didn't know you were going to act that way. I didn't know that this was going to happen to you. No. He cares about everything in our lives. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. We're also accompanied by his companionship. <coughs> Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 says this, Now this is what the Lord says. Anytime you see that in the Bible, Take note of that. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid because I have reclaimed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you go through the sea, I am with you. When you go through rivers, they will not sweep you away. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned and the flames will not harm you. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never leave you nor forsake you. Our theme today is being thankful in a thankless world. Number one, remember God is faithful. Number two, remember God is forgiving. And number three, remember that God is our Father. <coughs> There's a fourth area that Jesus commanded his followers to do. We're going to do that today. He commands us, number four, to remember the communion of Christ. It's a special time that we as believers set aside to examine our hearts our motives, a time of repentance, recommitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. As Bobby and Don come to lead us in, in communion, I, I want to read some scriptures that we don't often read. These scriptures are what Paul said to the believers as a warning for all who come to the Lord's table. And I believe that it's important for each one of us to hear the scripture because what we do here, we're, we're such a unique uh, worship environment. We, we have what we call an open communion. And so what that means is that if you're a believer, you've accepted Christ as your Savior, then you're welcome to participate no matter what denominational background you have. But first, I, I, want to, I want you to listen to what Paul says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 32, he says, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. If you give no thought or worse, don't care about the broken body of the master when you eat and drink you're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you, even now, are listless and sick. 
Others have gone to an early grave. Do you get this? That when you don't take time to examine your heart and your motives to test, David said, Lord, test me. Test my faith. See if there's anything ungodly in me. And help me deal with that. Help me to overcome that. Help me to be in agreement with you that I am struggling. He says, if we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later. Better to be confronted by the master now than to face a fiery confrontation later. What I'd like for us to do this morning is I'd like for us to take just a few quiet moments for all of us before we come to the Lord's table to examine our hearts before the Lord. I want us to take this opportunity to come into agreement with Him for any area of sin that you might either be stuck in or that you might be struggling with. I don't know what it is in your life. I do know what it is in mine. And I, I encourage each one of us to allow the grace of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to wash over your spirit and bring you back into right relationship with Christ. You know, the, the sins that we struggle with, it, I'm not talking about, you know, all these Terrible, terrible sins. There, there are plenty out there that we overlook sometimes. Pride. Gossip. Jealousy. Judgmental attitudes. All, all these little things that we say, well, that's just who I am. That's just part of my personality. Well, might have been in your old life. But if you have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, then it shouldn't be that. You may make a mistake every now and then. I saw a church sign yesterday that, you know, a, a mistake uh, made a mistake made over and over again is a decision. So remember the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. How's that working for you? And so it affects our relationship with Christ. And I truly believe that if we'll take a few moments and do that, that he will restore the joy of your salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who cares, a God who listens, a God who responds. We lift up all of these struggles, these sins, these, these things that God trip us up, these obstacles. And we pray this morning, God, that as we come to meet you here, to partake of the body 
and the blood. That, Lord, you would truly meet us here. And you would renew our spirits. You would return to us the joy of our salvation. That we might be better prepared to live for you. To share our faith. To engage a world around us, God. That is a thankless society. We pray your blessings today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bobby and Dawn. totally aware and almost overwhelmed at the thought that I would touch this bread or hold this cup in my hand. But I'm also overwhelmed as right now I hear Jesus say, Bobby, come to me. Come to me. This is for you. This takes away your sin. And that's the invitation that I give to you. The same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he said to his disciples, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. After supper he took the cup and he blessed it and said, I want all of you to drink from this. This is my blood, a new covenant, shed for you and for many, and we are the many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. He said, do this. So we do this in remembrance of him. Just so you know, those of you who would prefer unfermented wine, this is your uh, plate right here. This is wine. This is wine. Doesn't matter which way you want to go. If you want to dip your bread in the wine and eat it, that's fine. If you want to eat the bread, drink from the cup, that's fine. Nobody's going to get a, a disease from it. It's a special cup. <laughs> <laughs> really, it really is. So, you're welcome to come to the table of Christ. You want to come first. Thank you. 